Your car is a 3,000 pound tomb. That gasoline you're hunting, the fuel you pray for, it's a ghost. It's gone, and it is never coming back. But that pile of rotting garbage outside your fortress, the plastic bottles and shredded tires, that is a refinery. It smells like a chemical fire had a baby with death. It's thick as crude, but it's the only thing that will get you out alive. You've been told fuel is scarce. That is the single greatest lie of the apocalypse. Fuel is everywhere. You just don't know how to cook it. I'm going to show you how to turn that plastic graveyard into liquid gold. The new reality, your engine will drink anything. Forget premium unleaded. Forget octane ratings. Those are luxuries from the before times. Your engine is a desperate, primitive beast. It doesn't need refined gasoline. It just needs a controlled explosion. It needs hydrocarbons. And the world is still made of hydrocarbons. That plastic bottle, that styrofoam cup, that old rubber boot, it's all just chains of hydrogen and carbon, trapped sunlight from millions of years ago. Our job isn't to find fuel. Our job is to liberate it. We are going to do this three ways. By cooking trash, by brewing alcohol, and by capturing the zombie gas that still lurks in the infrastructure. But first, the most vital and most dangerous method, the art of pyrolysis. Method one, the alchemy of waste. This is not burning. Burning requires oxygen and destroys the fuel. We are doing the opposite. We are performing surgery on a chemical level, a process called pyrolysis which means breaking apart with fire. You will cook the trash in a sealed container, starving it of oxygen until it suffocates, cracks apart, and bleeds its energy. First, you must build your reactor. Find a strong metal container with a lid that can be sealed airtight. A 55-gallon steel drum is perfect. An old water heater or a propane tank that's been safely emptied will also work. This must be steel. Aluminum will melt. Now you must gather your feedstock. You are hunting for long-chain polymers. This includes almost all plastics. Look for the recycling numbers 1, 2, 4, and 5. Polyethylene, polypropylene. These are solidified oil. Avoid PVC, the plastic marked with a 3, as heating it releases chlorine gas. That chlorine will mix with hydrogen in the vapor to create hydrochloric acid, a toxic cloud that will not only sear your lungs, but corrode your reactor and destroy your engine from the inside out. Besides plastic, gather dry wood, corn stalks, and especially old car tires. Tires are incredibly energy dense, but they will produce a fuel high in sulfur, which smells like hell and is corrosive to rubber seals. Once your reactor is packed tight with this fuel, you must seal the lid. Weld it, clamp it, or even use a high temperature furnace cement or a wet clay mud mixture if you're desperate. It must be airtight. Drill a hole in the top and securely jam a metal pipe into it. A copper pipe is best for heat transfer, but any steel pipe or even an old car's exhaust tube will suffice. This pipe is your exit valve. Run this pipe downhill away from the reactor and submerge a section of it in the coldest water you can find. A stagnant pond, a bucket of snow, anything. This is your condenser. The longer the section of pipe submerged in water, the more efficient your condensation will be and the less fuel you will lose as flammable vapor escaping the end. Now, you build a massive fire under the reactor. You are not just warming it, you are assaulting it with heat, pushing it past 400 degrees Celsius. You have no thermometer. Your signal is the drum itself. Wait until the steel begins to glow a dull, menacing red in the twilight. Inside, the magic is happening. The intense heat, without oxygen, is violently shaking the long molecular chains of the plastic and rubber. These chains, thousands of atoms long, are cracking and breaking apart into smaller, lighter, and more volatile chains. This is thermal cracking. These new, shorter chains are the very same hydrocarbons that make up gasoline, diesel, and kerosene. As the contents break down, a thick, oily vapor will be forced out. It has nowhere to go but through your pipe. When this superheated vapor hits the cold pipe submerged in water, it will crash condense, turning from a gas into a liquid. 
At the end of your pipe, a thick brownish black liquid will begin to drip out. It will smell like hell. This is your plastic crude. This is your pyrolysis juice. It's not perfect. It's a chaotic cocktail of methane, gasoline-like compounds, diesel-like compounds, and tar. It's thick, dirty, and volatile, but it will burn. You can refine it further by running it through the process again, a secondary cracking, but that's a luxury. For now, this is your ticket out. But pouring this directly into a modern car is suicide for the engine. It's too thick and it's full of soot. You must filter it. Create a multi-stage filter. A large funnel or a cone made from a plastic bottle stuffed first with a layer of cloth, then a thick layer of crushed charcoal from your fire, then a layer of fine sand, and finally another layer of cloth. Pour the oil through. The cloth catches the big particulate. The sand catches the finer silt. The charcoal, being highly porous, will absorb some of the most volatile and toxic chemical compounds, cleaning it up just enough. Even filtered, it's a gamble. It might be too thick, in which case you can try to cut it with a lighter fluid, like scavenged kerosene or even the alcohol we're about to make. If it's too thin, you've overcooked it, boiling off the heavier chains and leaving you with something closer to lighter fluid. You must test it. Dip a rag in the liquid and light it. If it burns with a steady, oily, yellow-orange flame for at least 10 seconds, you have gold. If it flashes up in a whoosh and is gone, it's too volatile. If it just sputters and smokes, it's mostly tar. This is a brutal, toxic process. The fumes can kill you. The reactor can explode if your exit pipe gets clogged, but it turns a mountain of useless plastic into a tank of fuel. You have made something from nothing. But it's a dirty fuel. We need to understand why it works and how to make it better. The hydrocarbon skeleton key. Your engine is a box that turns explosions into motion. Gasoline is just the key. It needs to be a liquid, atomized into a mist, mix with air, be compressed by a piston, and then ignited by the spark plug. Not before. That not before is the entire secret. It's called octane. High octane fuel resists detonating under pressure alone. Low octane fuel explodes too early, creating a knock or ping that sounds like marbles rattling in your engine. That sound is your engine tearing itself to pieces. Our pyrolysis fuel has a terrible unknown octane rating. It's a gamble. This is why many survivors swear by the mothball. Yes, mothballs. The old-fashioned kind are made of naphthalene, a powerful octane booster. Naphthalene is an aromatic hydrocarbon, meaning it has a stable ring structure. This stability makes it much harder to ignite with pressure alone, so when you dissolve it into your fuel, it raises the overall octane rating of the mixture, preventing that engine-killing knock. Crushing one or two and dissolving them in your gallon of garbage gas can be the difference between a running engine and a cracked piston block. This fuel will also destroy the rubber seals in your fuel lines. The sulfur from the tires and the bizarre chemicals from the plastics will melt them. It's not a permanent solution. It is a get-me-to-the-next-town solution. But understanding this principle of controlled explosion opens up a second, more patient path. Method two, the farmer's fuel. If you have sugar and thyme, you can make a cleaner, more reliable fuel, ethanol. This is fermentation and distillation. You are, in short, making moonshine for your car. Your feedstock is anything with sugar, rotting fruit from a dead orchard, massive bags of sugar from a looted warehouse, cases of expired soda or energy drinks, or the classic, Corn. If you use corn, you must mash it, crush it, and boil it to release the starches. Then you need to add an enzyme, amylase, to break that starch into simple sugars. This enzyme can be scavenged from a brewery supply store, or you can create it by sprouting barley and crushing it into malt. Yes, you're basically making beer. Dump this sugary mash into a large container. Add water. Now you need yeast. You can scavenge packets of it from dead grocery stores or breweries, or even cultivate it from the skin of unwashed fruit or the dregs of old beer bottles. This is anaerobic fermentation. The yeast, which is a living organism, will eat the sugar and, in the absence of oxygen, excrete two things, carbon dioxide and alcohol. You must cover your container, but not seal it. The CO2 must escape. A simple airlock, a tube running from the lid into a cup of water, will let the gas bubble out without letting oxygen in. Now you wait for a week, maybe two, depending on the temperature. If it's too cold, the yeast will go dormant. 
You'll need to warm the container, perhaps by wrapping it in blankets or placing it near a gentle heat source. When the bubbling stops, the yeast has died, either from lack of sugar or because the alcohol content has risen to a level, around 10 to 15 percent, that is toxic to it. You are left with a low alcohol mash or wine. This wash is not fuel. It's mostly water. You must distill it. You need to build a still. At its simplest, this is just a pot with a lid, your boiler, a pipe running from the lid, and a collection vessel. You gently heat the wash. Alcohol boils at a lower temperature, around 78 degrees Celsius, than water, 100 degrees Celsius. The alcohol-rich steam rises first, travels down your pipe, and, just like in our pyrolysis reactor, you must cool that pipe to condense the vapor back into a liquid. This is where precision matters. The very first vapors that boil off, the heads, are full of methanol, wood alcohol. This stuff is poison, and it's terrible for your engine. You must discard the first ounce or so of liquid that comes out. What comes next is the heart of the run, the potent, desirable ethanol. This is your fuel. As the temperature of the wash continues to rise past 80 to 85 degrees Celsius, you'll start boiling off water and tails, which are heavier, oily alcohols. These will also make your fuel burn dirty, so you stop collecting. You'll be left with a liquid that is maybe 40 to 50% alcohol. This is not enough. You must run it through the still a second or third time to increase the purity. You're aiming for as close to pure as you can get. This is your fuel. Pure ethanol, E100, can run in many modern flex fuel vehicles. For older cars, you're better off mixing it with your pyrolysis crude or any gasoline you've scavenged. A mix of 85% garbage gas and 15% ethanol, E15, will make the crude burn cleaner, flow better, and significantly boost its octane. It's the civilized solution, but it takes weeks. What if you need to leave now? The energy trap, a brutal calculus. Before you celebrate, you must understand the first law of the wasteland. It takes energy to make energy. That pyrolysis reactor? It needs a massive hot fire, burning for hours. You will burn a huge pile of wood just to process one drum of plastic. You must calculate the net gain. Are you spending more energy in wood than you are getting out in liquid fuel? If you're in a dense forest, this is a good trade. If you're in a ruined city where wood is scarce, you might be losing the game. Fermentation is colder, but it costs time, and time is a resource you can't get back. This isn't just science, it's survival accounting. Every action has a cost. The true survivor is the one who can do the math fast enough. This brutal calculus is why mobility is life. Staying put makes you a target. It drains your local resources. Fuel is the antidote to stagnation. Which brings us to the third, most immediate option. Method three, the zombie generators. There is a third source of fuel. It's invisible, it's pressurized, and it's sitting in tanks all over the suburbs. Propane and natural gas. Every barbecue grill, every RV, and every mobile home has a propane tank. But the real treasure is the massive 500-gallon pig tank sitting next to rural homes and, more importantly, next to the backup generators for hospitals, data centers, and cell towers. These were designed to keep the lights on for weeks. That gas doesn't go bad. That tank from 2024 is still perfectly good in 2034. The problem is that your car runs on liquid, not gas. You can't just pipe propane into your fuel tank. You need to convert the engine. This requires bypassing the fuel injectors or carburetor and feeding the gas directly into the air intake, mixed with air at a precise ratio, usually about one part propane to 25 parts air. You'll need a vaporizer and a regulator. These parts can be scavenged from old propane-powered forklifts, ice resurfacing machines, or some commercial generators. The regulator is the brain. It takes the high-pressure gas from the tank, over 150 psi, and steps it down to just slightly above atmospheric pressure. But as the liquid propane expands into a gas, it gets incredibly cold. Cold enough to freeze the regulator solid. This is where the vaporizer comes in. It's a small heat exchanger that uses hot coolant from your engine's radiator to warm the propane, allowing it to vaporize completely without freezing the system. You run a hose from the vaporizer to a mixer, which you mount on top of your air intake. This mixer is a simple device that mixes the propane vapor with incoming air at the correct ratio. It's a complex modification, and a leak means you are driving a bomb. 
But if you can pull it off, you have a fuel source that is clean, stable, and plentiful. Your car will run rough like it's having a seizure, but it will run. Wasteland myths versus hard physics. The wasteland is full of bad ideas. You'll hear them whispered at every trading post. Just siphon gas from an old car. A terrible idea. Gasoline from the before times is dead. After a year, it phase separates. The ethanol in it absorbs water from the air and sinks to the bottom, leaving a top layer of low-octane varnish that will clog every line and injector. You'll hear just add sugar to his tank to kill his engine. It doesn't work. Sugar doesn't dissolve in gasoline. It just settles at the bottom. It's a myth. The only things that work are physics and chemistry. The only thing that matters is the controlled explosion. You are not a scavenger. You are a mechanic. You are an alchemist. You are a refiner. The Apocalypse Mechanics. Final warning. You are now armed with the knowledge to create power from thin air. But this knowledge is a weapon that can backfire. Always, always ground your containers. When you're brewing this volatile soup, static electricity is your mortal enemy. A single spark from your wool sweater or the plastic container you're pouring into can ignite the fumes and turn you into a cautionary tale spray painted on a wall. Always ground your reactor and your collection cans with a copper wire driven into the damp earth. The world ended, but the laws of physics didn't. Hydrocarbons are still the blood of motion. The knowledge of how to crack them, brew them, and capture them is the ultimate survival tool. It's not just about fuel. It's about refusing to be static. It's about movement. It's about life. You are not trapped. You are surrounded by resources. Now you know how to use them. What's the most desperate fuel source you've ever had to use or the most ingenious repair you've seen in the wild? Share your own wasteland mechanic stories below. The apocalypse respects improvisation.